I want to start by uh, simply saying that uh, I, was, I was a young movement one time. <laughs> I was a young person. And when I heard in my senior year of college, John Kennedy in his inaugural invite those of us who had something to offer, not to ask what the country could do for me, but for what I could do for the country. Uh, like many other people my age, we were really inspired. And you know, there are still some of us left down here in Washington, or down there in Washington. Um, let it not be forgot that once there was a spot for one brief shining moment that was known as Camelot. Camelot had come. We were all inspired. I had just entered the Central Intelligence Agency after being an Army Infantry and Intelligence Officer. I was just there seven months before President Kennedy was killed. So the very poignant strains of the Mozart Requiem meant a lot for me today. And there are lots of other phrases in there that I may, I may uh, cite here, if time permits. I remember who I was 51 years ago. Would you believe I was in the Pentagon Situation Room? We were young trainee officers for the CIA, and we were being, being given a, a tour of what goes on in the Pentagon Situation Room, and um, the word came. Uh, so it's not easy for me to forget, or to remember, actually, who I was. Um, had it all happened? Well, I recommend to you a book uh, that was written by James Douglas. It's named JFK and the Unspeakable. David Swanson alludes to it today in an incredibly good blog piece that he has put up. I hope all of you know of David Swanson. The press, of course, helped then and is helping now to cover everything up. It wasn't quite as bad then, but it was palpable. We had uh, Director William Colby saying publicly that we in the CIA control just about, uh, what is it, 90% of the people in the press who are important. Well, you know, that boggles the mind. I found it hard to believe in those days. No longer, no longer. And so what I always make a point to say on, on any occasion like this is that even though I've seen a lot of change in Washington over the last five year, 50 years, there's one that uh, dwarfs all the other changes in significance, and that is that we no longer have a free media, and that could not be bigger. The fourth estate is dead. What's the good news? Is there a fifth estate? Sure as hell is, huh? Young people don't read the New York Times, the Washington Post. They get everything from the net, from, from, the, from the web. And so that's a great hope for the future, because young people are beginning to find out what's going on in this world. So that's a biggie. And as we see, not only with the JFK assassination, Douglas's book is by far the best. H have you seen it reviewed anywhere? <sighs> I wonder why that is, huh? Hmm. OK, let me continue here. Um, H.R. 428, we need to give that the greatest support because I'll tr as I'll try to demonstrate here, it is key to the unraveling of what people knew, how people reacted or did not react to the copious information that was available before 9-11. The um, Congressional Joint Inquiry, uh, part of which was, were these 28 pages, uh, was what we in the Bronx used to call a crock. Um, it was set up with great opposition from virtually the whole establishment in Washington, including Porter Goss, head of the House Intelligence Committee, and sad to say, the head of the Senate Intelligence Committee. 
a fellow who's sort of redeemed himself now. His name is Bob Graham. Cheney challenged House Speaker Daschle by saying, you set up a committee like this, we're not gonna allow any uh, administration people to testify. Wow. But then it became clear that if uh, the administration didn't set up their own little controllable uh, exercise here to investigate, someone else would. And that's when they picked Goss and Graham to ride herd on what happened. First thing you knew, the FBI is crawling all over their Senate and House offices. Can you believe it? You know, that's a different branch of government. Congress has its own investigative uh, bodies. But Goss and Graham said, oh, yeah, there was a leak. Uh, welcome, all you FBI agents. And they wanted to interrogate and uh, subject to light detector examinations, congressmen and representatives. It was crazy. And that's the way it went. After it started out in feb February, they couldn't find an executive director for a couple of years. They worked till August, then they took a big uh, vacation. And finally, in the fall, uh, there was a report. Now, um, the report was quite, quite amazing uh, because um, Goss, Porter Goss, who was really uh, the bete noire and all this, he was clearly doing what Cheney told him to do. He said, now, Please understand, and this may sound familiar to you, uh, we're not out to establish guilt or accountability. No, 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 no. What we're trying to do is, quote, look for solutions, not scapegoats. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, right. I mean, Obama was a young, young boy then, I suppose, but he must, have, he must have watched Fox News to find out that you're not supposed to look backward, you just look Forward. I tried that on the NP NYPD when I was uh, speeding the other day. <laughs> it didn't work. I said, oh, let's just look forward. No, they said, <laughs> you know what they said, right? Okay. So they bowed to the FBI demands uh, that they could not interview the Saudis in San Diego. The FBI says, no, you can't. So, oh, okay. Sorry. Didn't mean to uh, ask. Um, uh, one of the Saudi intelligence agents who worked in California as a quasi-diplomat was allowed to leave right after 9-11. Nobody questioned him. Of course, you know how many Saudis were put on those planes right after 9-11. Right after um, George Tenet, who was the head of the CIA, uh, he would not agree to be interviewed by the uh, Congressional Joint Committee. And so they said, oh, gosh, that's too bad. Um, so what happened? What was, the, what was the report? Well, the report came out, I remember, I was in San Diego at the time, my, my youngest son was working there, and I couldn't believe it. Uh, what uh, Eleanor Hill, who, to her credit, tried to do an honest job against insuperable odds, what she said, what she said was this. Um, According to the White House and the Central Intelligence Agencies, um, and we fought about this well into the evening, uh, Bush's knowledge of intelligence information relevant to this inquiry remains classified, even when the substance of the intelligence information has already been declassified. That was the case in the committee's final report and we still don't know what was in those 29 pages or anything else that the joint inquiry found out about what Bush knew. What a great inquiry, huh? Well, it goes from bad to worse, guys. Next thing you know, we have a commission. Now, thanks to the pressure from the families, we had a commission, uh, but it was again Croc Part Two. Uh, who was set up to, to do it? Well, well-heeled people like Governor Keene from New Jersey, who knew nothing about Washington and its ways and admitted it. He said, well, I'll go down there uh, one day a week and, and I'll learn. And he later complained that it took him six hours to get through security 
uh, before he could go read anything, and then they wouldn't let him take any notes, and he complained about that. You know, it's really hard to be the head of this commission if they wanted you to do that kind of stuff. Uh, Lee Hamilton, he's the Democrat, quasi-Democrat, that they trot out to, to be on these commissions. Uh, he screwed up on Iran-Contra royally, okay? And so for services performed, he gets to co-chair this. That's what we, and you know, if, if we needed further, further reason for proof, I mean, who was picked to be the initial chairman of the committee? Anybody remember? <laughs> who? Henry Kissinger, <laughs> Paradi the paradigm of honesty, huh? And what kind of clients did Henry Kissinger have a lot of? Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia. wow, okay. And was, uh, uh, and John Brennan, uh, who, was, uh, who was interested in all this, uh, where was he the chief of station for the CIA? Saudi Arabia, man, I tell you, we got a good Saudi connection here, or complex, or nexus nexes of a connection. So, when uh, Henry Kissinger was faced down to the family's credit and uh, removed from consideration, well, of course he did it by his own will, he, he, went and told him he, couldn't, he couldn't do it, you know. Uh, then we had Max Clayland, you know, am double amputee from Vietnam, knows a little about, about war that the others didn't, and all of a sudden, he's off the commission. So what do you end up with? You end up with 10 members of what my Irish grandmother used to call the upper crust. Now, you know what the upper crust is, do you not? Well, I'll tell you. It's a bunch of crumbs held together by a lot of dough. I remember writing at the time, and, and I couldn't get into the post at the time, so I, this one was in the Birmingham News. Not a bad rag there in Birmingham, Alabama. I said, why should we care about all this? Well, one needed only to think of the still disputed findings of the commissions that investigated the assassinations, of John Kennedy, Dr. King, to feel the corrosive effects on a body politic when cataclysmic events like this are shoddily investigated with their conclusions deservedly suspect. Now, what I'd like to do is turn to uh, um, San Diego specifically and do what we used to call at the Harvard Business School, a kind of as case study. I mean, I won't even mention those two well-heeled Saudis that left very abruptly, uh, left all their papers and their fancy cars behind, uh, whose telephone records indicated that they were in copious contact with uh, Mohammed Atta. I, I wouldn't even mention them. Or, or the flight school people in, in Phoenix, uh, people learning how to fly a plate, plate. Or in, in uh, uh, Minnesota, learning how to fly a plate. <laughs> Jeez. Learning how to fly a plane without uh, bothering about how to land it or even take off. So I wouldn't even mention it. I'm just going to talk about San Diego, okay? Now. We have the 28 pages that are not available, and we have uh, Bandar Bush, also known as uh, Prince Bandar, who was the ambassador in Washington for about 87 years, I believe. Uh, but he was very close to the Bush family. And we had those people flying off, about two dozen of whom were related in some way to the bin Laden family. We had two people who the CIA knew were terrorists, and who the CIA knew were in San Diego, but who the CIA says they never told the FBI, or Richard Clark. Oh. Now, to his credit, and I think Richard Clark is one of the good guys here, I only wish that he hadn't, didn't wait until he had published his book, until he published his book, to speak out. They all do that down in Washington. It's not as though he needs any more money. He should have come out right away, okay? And I think he's still susceptible to pressure because after all, he's one of the few, or maybe he's the only one who apologized, right? Well, Clark talked to two rather obscure 
community radio people in Denver in 2009 and said, George Tenet told me everything except, except the presence of these two terrorist suspects in San Diego. And uh, so the interviewer said, well, how do you figure that? It, was it inadvertence? And Clark said, no, it would have had to have been a positive actual intervention by George Tennant, the director, to deprive me of that information. Well, how many others knew it? Clark says, 50 all told at CIA knew it, but they wouldn't tell the FBI. Ooh. Now, has uh, Tennant ever been asked about that? Or the FBI? They need to be. They need to be under oath, okay? Another thing that, uh, that occurs here is the fact that NSA, and I, I want you to, to pause here because this is important. NSA had been monitoring Al-Qaeda very carefully in the years prior. They had done a substantive report identifying the various nodes, the various places where people were, and they were intercepting. They were intercepting the communications telephone from San Diego, from these two terrorists, back to Yemen, where the safe house was with the central for the communications. And guess what? People say, well, they only had the metadata. They had the content. How many conversations? The president says one. That's curious. The chief of the counterterrorism uh, center says seven. So, they had the content, they had the warning. Now, how do you explain that NSA didn't share that information, which is its job with the FBI or the CIA or anybody in government? Uh, people who work at NSA, uh, whom I know pretty well, I tend to explain it by saying, well, knowledge is power, and, uh, you know, once you, once you give out that information, it's not yours anymore. And, uh, you know, I'll say, wow, I don't know. And the people, the FBI or the people of CIA say the same thing. You know, if we had told the FBI about those two terrorists in, in San Diego, then we wouldn't have been able to flip them. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to turn them as the, the, the term we use in intelligence. We wouldn't be able to double them, okay? George Tenet had zero agents in Al-Qaeda. Here's two live bodies. He could be able to double them, but not if he told the FBI, because then they would come under FBI jurisdiction, San Diego being part of this, these United States. So there's all kinds of things that need to be sorted out here, and a lot of this is clearly covered up. What Richard Clark has said right on the record is that if FBI and CIA had done their jobs properly, quote, at least some of the hijackers could have been captured before the attacks of 9-11. Even Musawi, the fellow that I didn't want to mention in Minnesota, they captured him about 10, 15 days before 9-11, couldn't get the FBI headquarters to give them permission to look into his, web, into his laptop. Now, how's that figure? The lawyer responsible for denying that permission, he got a, a major, major prize from the FBI the next year, equivalent to his already six-figure salary. Figure that one out. So, cover-up? Of course there's a cover-up. The question is, what's well, being covered up? I want to say one more thing, because I, I think it, it does uh, relate uh, to the 28 pages. And that thing is torture. Now, I've been writing and thinking a lot about torture, mostly because the CIA is, is redacting all the verbs, or alternatively, all the nouns out of the, uh, the Senate uh, Intelligence Committee report on torture. So it's not really intelligible. And uh, there's this little kabuki dance going on where the president says, John Brennan, would you please make sure that you don't, uh, we don't reveal any sources or methods here? John Brennan redacts it. He gives it to the Senate and says, oh, we can't understand it now because you're taking too much out. They give it back to the president and the president says, oh, John, would you, you know, hello, 
They don't want it out. Now, why do I raise it in this connection? Because that 9-11 Commission report depended almost exclusively on three terrorists who were waterboarded to a fare thee well. Okay? Now, can you get reliable information from torture techniques? Well, let me cite the head of Army Intelligence, who in 2006, when he heard that George Bush was going to pretend the, the, the opposite, he came out very courageously at a press conference in the Pentagon. His name was John Kimmons, and he said this, and I quote, no reliable intelligence has ever come from harsh interrogation techniques. History shows that. And the experience of the past five years, he's saying this in 2006, the experience of the last five years also demonstrates this period, end quote. So you can't get good information uh, about torture, from torture. So, People say, well, why torture then, you know, besides just show, showing that you can? Well, it's really pretty simple, folks. If you want bad information, I mean, t torture works like a charm. If you want to prove that Al-Qaeda was working with Saddam Hussein, man, this fellow Alibi that they captured, he wouldn't tell our interrogators that, but when they sent them to the Egyptians, who are more accomplished at these techniques. Gosh, he spilled the beans and said, oh yeah, I was a travel agent. I sent all manner of Al-Qaeda people up to be trained in explosives and weapons with the Saddam Hussein. And President Bush announced that the next day as though it were true, it was a lie. And Ali B said that as soon as they mistakenly released him. He says, it was a crock. He says, I, I didn't, don't think he said crock. He says, I just, I just told him that, that I knew that what they wanted me to say. And so, uh, that's why I told them. Now, how does this relate here? Well, if what the interrogators, and there were CIA interrogators, were after uh, was a certain story about what happened in 9-11, man, uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was waterboarded. Does anybody remember how many times? 100 and 187. Man, this is a good group. Yeah. Abu Zubaydah, how many? Just 83, I think. And there was one other. So all I'm saying here is that even Senator Kerry from Nebraska, who was on the commission, said, when I learned about how they got this information that formed the basis for all our judgment, I said, oh, gosh, this is, this is really this is a little suspect. So let me finish up here. What, all I'm trying to say here is there are so many things that need to be uh, need to be put together. I hate to say connect the dots, but that's what we're trying to do. Um, and I think those 28 pages uh, are going to start the unraveling, just like a mummy. You know, if you take off that little, little first uh, linen, you're going to unravel the whole thing. And so it's really, really important that we get those people under oath, that we get a separate investigation, which makes the only kind of sense that we have. And what we need to do that I think, is a broad movement that cares not only about this kind of thing, and specifically this, but about torture, and about eavesdropping, and about all the indignities that have been inflicted upon us as a result of 9-11. Because I'll ask you to finish the sentence here. After 9-11, everything changed, right? Including including this document, which happens to be the Constitution of the United States. I'll say one last thing, because I think it's illustrative. Uh, we all have our own opportunities and our own call and our own chances to make a different difference. Um, Edward Snowden, who I'm, I'm pre pleased to be able to call my friend now, having visited him again in September, um, I learned from a Forbes magazine article that one of his co-workers in Honolulu went to Forbes. Now, Forbes is not a left-wing rag by any chance, right? Okay. She went to Forbes, 
And she said, look, you know, I really don't like this character assassination that's being applied there. It's known he was the best of the best. The reason he could do all those things is because he alone could do all these things. And besides that, every week or so, he'd whip out this constitution that he held on his desk, and he'd say to us, you know, there's a Fourth Amendment here, and I'm not sure what we're doing is really consonant. Do you, does this bother you guys? And we would all say, Ed, you like it here in Honolulu? Well, yeah. You like your six figure? Yeah. Well, forget about it. Forget about it, Ed. So I asked Ed, I said, are you aware of that? He says, yeah, someone told me about that. I said, well, how do you feel about that? And his answer surprised me. And I recommend the lessons in it for your consideration. If it were I, I would have said, yeah, those people all knew we were committing crimes and didn't have the guts. But not Ed. Ed says, he said to me, you know, I know, I knew that someone had to do this. And as I looked around, she had a big mortgage. Uh, they had three kids. Uh, all of them had family and other responsibilities that I didn't have. And so I looked in the mirror and I said, well, somebody's got to do this, Ed, and I, I guess that would be you. Wow. There was no grudges. There was no criticism. He accepted that not everybody is in the place where they can make that kind of difference, but some of you are, or some of you will be, or you know who people, you know people who are. And what we need to do is rise to the occasion. I'd like to, to finish simply by by quoting uh, one of the other mothers, Terry, which I had recorded here um, on an article I wrote at the time. Her name was Kathy Ashton. And she was in, in high dudgeon at the, the way the various investigations were going. She lost a 21-year-old son at the World Trade Center. And she said, you know, she told Newsweek, we need to know the truth because my son cannot have died in vain. This can't happen to somebody else, but it will if we don't figure out what went wrong. Now, last thought comes from one of my favorite prophets, Rabbi Heschel, Abraham Heschel, who was a, a terrific prophet during Vietnam and subsequent years. And he pointed out, you know, uh, Indifference uh, to injustice, injustice, indifference to evil is worse, actually, than evil itself. Now, we're all not guilty, he said, but we all are responsible. And so let's shoulder that responsibility. My hat's off to the folks working on the 9-11 problem. Uh, Les uh, Jameson and all the people from the early days of not in our name and the world can't wait and all the other 9-11 folks. Let's get to it. Let's put our shoulders to the wheel, not be intimidated by the likes of uh, Dick Cheney. And let's do it because it really is up to us, those of us who have children and grandchildren, want a different country from the one that we have descended into. Thank you very much. <laughs>